I actually wanted to just have sort of an informal you know, conversation, tell a little bit about Singapore and Trul, I know uh, Espen out there and I can talk a little bit too, but talk about what, uh, what I've been working on and some potential opportunities to do interesting work over there or here and for, for areas of collaboration. Uh, I don't know, do you guys know anything at all about sort of what's going on in Singapore and where we stand? So, well, I'll give you the, you know, the sort of what I know, which is basically that, so, so Duke and National University of Singapore started a medical school about four years ago. So the, the first medical school is now in their last year, so they'll graduate, the first class will graduate this year. Uh, and it's about, it's pretty small, I think it's 20 something uh, students, but the, the second and third and, and, and from now on is about 55 to 60 students. And uh, all the students over there in their third year do a research year. Uh, and so they work with faculty. And in fact, last year we started a PhD program. And the PhD program, uh, as with the medical school, they graduate with joint degrees in from Duke and from National University of Singapore. And the PhD program is a PhD in what's called integrative biology and medicine. And basically they all do a common first semester coursework uh, that's jointly taught by what's called the five signature research programs in in Singapore in the medical school and, and health services and systems research is the one that, that I'm in. And then there's one in cardio uh, metabolic disorders, which helped me out cancer and stem cell biology, uh, EID, emerging infectious diseases, neuro and behavioral disorders. That may be it. Yeah. Uh, and so they rotate through and then they pick uh, which of these programs they want to work with and they pick faculty members. So in fact, I have one student who is embarking on her PhD with me, and then next year we're going to bring in another 12 students or so. So we'll have a, an MD and PhD program, uh, and it's actually going, you know, it seems to be going quite well. We, you know, we're sort of, I think, reached a saturation point where it's not so crazy. It's good. And so the, the, the other thing that is probably worth thinking about as you go through, so the Singapore, just very quickly, the healthcare system in Singapore is largely the, the general Singapore motto is the individual, then family, then government. So for example, the, the healthcare system, everybody who, who has a job who's not self-employed has a, what's called a Medisave account, which is basically a health savings account. And this health savings account can grow up to around $40,000. They actually cap it for some reason. I don't understand. But basically, so if you need inpatient care, you can use your, your Medisave account. Anything that's not inpatient is cash pay, but the government subsidizes drugs and certain services. And in fact, if you go to a government-run clinic, what's called a polyclinic, uh, you wait in long lines, but you get free care. So basically, if, if, you're, if you need it and you run out of money, uh, they will go to your family. And your family can volunteer, you know, siblings, parents, kids, to pay for your services out of their account, but the government also retains the right to force your family members to pay. It's a very different model here in the US. And in fact, I was giving an obesity lecture to one of my students, uh, and she said she's been pushing her parents to, to diet and exercise because she doesn't want to pay for their health care when they get older. So, so there's some interesting sort of incentives and disincentives built into that system. And in fact, because it's so different from the U.S. model, where sort of the seniors, everybody has Medicare, gets all the services you want, there are, there are questions that you can ask and answer in Singapore that you couldn't do here, for example. So I actually am just beginning a study uh, looking at stage four colon cancer patients and trying to understand the treatment choices that they make. Uh, you know, everybody with stage four colon cancer is going to die within two years or less or most everybody. Some will die spending very little money and some will die spending quite a bit of money for high-end drugs. But in Singapore, what we're looking at is the extent to which your treatment choices vary based on how much money you have in your Medisave account. And the, it's been a tricky study to get going because the people seem to, you know, from economists, what I say is, look, you know, if people want to leave their, their Medisave account for their kids and they don't want to get this high in care and they die faster, that's fine. I don't see that as, as a bad outcome. But there's an, this inherent reaction that 
that's a bad outcome. And so the government has been very nervous about this type of research. And so, you know, for like tools, tools can say, like, like physicians always talk about need, healthcare need. And, you know, our argument is there are very few things that people need. And in fact, I would argue that treatment for stage four cancer is probably not something people need to the extent that the marginal benefit of that treatment is actually fairly limited. And so these are sort of the types of studies that you can you can do in Singapore as long as you're you're a little bit careful about how you couch them that you couldn't do in the US. And so you know we're trying to embark on those those types of studies and, and I think they're they're quite informative and will tell tell us a lot about value and how people value medical services. Uh, cancer is one area. End of life care is a really hot topic, and so there's a big palliative care group within our, or sort of in partnership with our signature research program, uh, and so we're we're trying to get lots of studies on going, looking at palliative care issues and and sort of how people make choices. And in fact, one other comment, and then I'll, I'll start in is because of Singapore's sort of emphasis on on no drugs and, and that kind of stuff. They, they tend not to give pain meds to people at the end of life, and so people tend to die in quite a bit of pain in Singapore, and this is sort of a cultural phenomenon, and so we're, you know, some of the studies we're looking at are sort of how to convince physicians to be a little more liberal with the, the pain meds. And so Chetna and I are working on a, a, a study looking at some of those end of life issues, and, and there's quite a few studies ongoing in that area. but. Uh, so I, you know, if we have time, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the uniqueness aspects of, of Singapore. But let me let me go. A lot of this research is sort of U.S. based because I'm still sort of finishing out U.S. based grants, and then Singapore studies that are either in proposal stages or you know just funded and just starting out. But it, it, as I talk about these things, please you know stop me if you have any any thoughts or anything because uh, they're sort of in a, in their infancy. And, and, some stages. So, <clears throat> any comments or questions before I get going? So let me. Uh, I, I, mostly, I'm going to talk about some of the obesity work. Although, as I said, there's other stuff that that I'm interested in and that we have going. But uh, this seemed to be a, a good area to focus for this particular talk. And I'll, I'll talk. Uh, food pricing and food information is is sort of a hot topic, and economic incentives and disincentive is also an area that I'm I'm actively engaged in. So I'll I'll talk about those. Uh, but let me give you guys a little bit of background information. This is just a, a, a World Health Organization slide about obesity prevalence rates, which you may have seen. Uh, certainly things look bleak in, in lots of the world. Now I'll give you a little bit of information about, about obesity in Asia. It's quite low by international standards, although increasing fairly rapidly. And in fact, the, the interesting thing about, about obesity in Asia is it seems like the evidence suggests that obesity-related diseases tend to happen at a lower BMI. So BMIs as low as 23 or 23 and a half actually increase risk uh, for diabetes, for example. And so uh, if you look at the data, there's not a very high prevalence of obesity based on the U.S. cut point. But if you look at, at, at a lower cut point where you know, these types of diseases are happening sort of at equal prevalence, it's actually not as, as good as you might think. And in fact, Here's some data just looking at 25 or greater BMI. And it's, you know, it's certainly better than the US, but not, not great. I mean, people generally think of Asia as a place where everybody is, is thin, and in fact, that's, that's certainly not true. And even in Southeast Asia, if you look at, at Vietnam and sort of who's the, uh, Malaysia, for example, or South Korea, I mean, uh, it's not great. And in fact, I don't know if it's on this slide or the next slide. In Singapore, obesity prevalence in the last five years went from seven to 12%. So 12% is low, but that's a pretty large increase. And Singapore is certainly worried uh, about obesity. And so there's lots of opportunities to do that type of research in Singapore and Asia too. So uh, real quick, this is a story I always tell. Just I'm an economist and I think about all of these problems from that perspective and in fact, uh, th this is sort of an interesting sociological example of, of obesity. It turns out that in Mauritania, for young girls to get a, a good husband, they, they generally need to be fat. The fatter, the better for getting a good husband. And in fact, that's an economic phenomenon because if you're wealthy enough to fatten up your, your, your daughters and, and granddaughters and you're rich and guys tend to, to like that, it turns out. And so uh, 
there's, you know, for decades and generations, moms and grandmas would fatten up their kids. And in fact, in, in the 1980s and, and early 1990s, there was a civil war in Mauritania and a scarcity of food. And food prices went way up. And when food prices went up, it just became too expensive to, to fatten up the, the young girls. And so they actually thinned down quite a bit. And then it turns out uh, about 10 years ago, things settled down. And as soon as things settled down and food became more prevalent, food prices dropped. And now they're actually running fat camps where they're sending these girls off to camp to, to fatten up again. And you're seeing this, this sort of cycle. And so, you know, my argument is that, you know, for the same reason that obesity went away and then came back in Mauritania, uh, you know, it describes obesity in the U.S. and in Singapore as well. It's just a change in relative prices. So, you know, the, the, the key point for this is, is prices are driving behavior or opportunity costs. Uh, it's not changes in social norms. It wasn't like suddenly people in Mauritania decided they liked thin girls and then they liked fat girls. There's this, you know, cultural norm that's consistent. In the U.S., you know, certainly for most of us, thinness is preferred, but yet two-thirds of us are overweight or obese. And to me, it's a, it's a classic economic story. Right? And so whenever I think about obesity interventions, you know, are they consistent with this basic model? And so the argument that I tend to make is if you don't change costs or benefits associated with behaviors, you're not going to see any sustained behavior change. And in fact, I think there's a fair amount of evidence to support that, in, even in obesity, and then if you look at tobacco and other things as well. So that's sort of the, the way I look at things as an economist. So, you know, so if you, if you buy that story, then, then in fact, you know, obesity is really a result of changes in, in you know, relative prices, food consumption, certainly. Uh, if you look at food prices in the U.S., they actually were increasing relative to non-food prices until the late 70s, if you look at, at the CPI, and then they tended to drop. And in fact, it was energy-dense foods that saw the greatest relative price decreases. And so those are the ones that have the added sugars and added fats. And, you know, we see people consuming more of those foods. Technology, certainly with physical activity, we've seen that in, in every dimension at work, at home, and in between. So people just don't burn a lot of calories. Uh, now, the, the third one is one, actually, be interested in your thoughts on this. So this is a hypothesis that I suspect is in some sense testable, although I don't know if it's true. Uh, you know, obesity is clearly bad for your health, uh, but it turns out that we're quite good at treating many of the conditions that obesity promotes and increasingly good. And in fact, there's a, there's a paper published uh, by CDC colleagues a couple years ago that shows that today's obese uh, population actually has a better cardiovascular disease profile than normal weight individuals did at the time of the earlier NHANES, NHANES 1. And so part of that is because of drugs and technology. So you can take, you know, lipids for cholesterol and antihypertensives and there are actually a million over a million uh, procedures performed last year to unclog clogged arteries in the U.S. And so, you know, w one of the things I wonder is to what extent are, are people sort of optimally gaining weight because they recognize that the consequences of excess weight are just less than they used to be. And so, you know, if people see, you know, obesity as not being so costly, then why should they worry about it? And, uh, you know, I, that's, I think, testable. I don't have any really good data to support that, but, uh, it has some intuitive appeal. And the, the, the two first factors, presumably, it's more like an immediate um, kind of trade-off. But for health costs, they may, of course, occur a number of years down the road. So it's kind of slightly different way of, or maybe kind of waking it up that you have to kind of say, well, the benefits of kind of being unhealthy you kind of get today, but yeah, the costs right. may not be incurred in another time of 20 years. Uh, right, so certainly, even if technology is unchanged, cookies always taste good and exercise always seems to be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And then you think, you know, you, you discount the sort of future consequences and so you don't worry about them. But my point is those future consequences may not be as bad today as they were 20 years ago. And in fact, in 20 years from now, they may not be, you know, nearly as bad. And in fact, if people are sort of looking at technological change and sort of seeing the curve, it, it certainly they may be right. And in fact, the reality is 
if you look at, at mortality, obesity rate and mortality data, although the morbidity of obesity is fairly high, the mortality effect, uh, until your BMI gets above 35, it's about 70, 75 pounds overweight, it is pretty small, and in fact, depending on the study, may, not, may be non-existent, maybe one year at the most, two years. Certainly when you get above 35 or above 40, there's a huge mortality difference. But for, for somebody who has a BMI of 30, 31, the mortality effects, I'm not sure, are even there. And the morbidity effects may be there, but like I said, I mean, we're pretty good at, at treating some of these conditions. So I don't know, I don't know if that's true, but if, we ha if you guys can think of ways to, to test that, it would be interesting to, to take a look at. It. I can tell you, we published a paper several years ago where we asked people to rate their risk of diseases and to, to tell us how old they thought they would be when they died. Which, by the way, is a question you can't ask in Singapore because they're very superstitious about that. So most people wouldn't answer that question. But in fact, when we did it in the US, what we found was that people actually uh, overestimated their, their risks of obesity related. Well, we, so we stratified the results by BMI and we looked whether or not obese people sort of correctly predicted their excess risk, and what we found was that they, they thought they were at a greater risk for obesity-related diseases than they actually were. Uh, and in fact, they overestimated the mortality effect. So certainly people are, are recognizing that their weight is increasing their risk for poor health. So it's not, as I said earlier, I mean, it's not an information deficit problem. I mean, people seem to, to, to have some sense that they're at increased risk, but my suspicion is they also know that diet and exercise is a lot of work, and probably most people, we certainly know this from the literature, most people who are overweight or obese have at times tried and failed to lose weight. And that's certainly not surprising because it's really hard and increasingly hard to lose weight in, a, in an environment like ours. And in fact, just, just to follow up on the story, if you look at obesity rates in the US, there's this general perception, I don't, I don't think I have data on this. Uh, so there's this general perception that obesity is a problem of poverty. Uh, but by and large, that's not true. It used to be true, but fact, if you look at the NHANES data today, uh, for males, for example, and you stratify it by income, there's really no income effect for males. Poor people and rich men have about the same obesity prevalence. For women, there is a slight income effect, but the reality is there's a giant race effect, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, and once you control for race, the income effect is very modest. So in the U.S., it's, it's not really a, that obesity is a problem of, of, of poverty. Uh, people like to believe that to be true, but by and large, it's not. And in fact, if you look in the developed world where obesity is becoming most prevalent, it's wealthier people in China and India because as soon as they get money, they buy cars, they, they join country clubs, and they just cease to engage in any physical activity. And in fact, it, a little bit different in those countries. So if you're poor in China, for example, you're working in a manual labor job on a farm, and you're getting lots of activity, you're eating raw food stuff, same, same with India. Uh, whereas if you're rich, you, you, you're in the cities and you're, you're doing all, so there's, a, there's actually a bigger gap. Whereas in the US, if you're poor, you're probably working you know, fast food or some job, but it's, it's, you're eating lots of fast food and you're, you're working at a low wage job, but it's generally fairly sedentary because we really only have sedentary jobs. So there, so there's a different mix at play in developed and developing countries, and you're seeing that play out in the data. But again, that sort of the driving force really to me is that people don't demand to be obese, but they demand the goods and services that obesity promotes, and they actually like those things. So it's sort of an endogenous outcome, and I make the argument that any, sort of any country going through the, the, the economic transition from developed to developing world is going to see rising rates of obesity among wealthier households, and then poor households will catch up uh, as they sort of, you know, become less reliant on manual labor. So fairly bleak, but fairly true, I would suspect. And so a lot of the work that we're trying to get going is we're really looking at these issues in Southeast Asia and China and India. Any comments on any of that? I think it's kind of stereotypically, at least, that's kind of how it was perceived I mean, in, in Britain and in, in Victorian times also, that you had a kind of a capitalist who was a big guy, and then you had that's the right, yeah. workers who were the scrawny, undernourished guys. So I, there may be some of the same phenomena happening in, in Europe and the US, but at the much, much earlier uh, time period. Uh, 
Yeah, right. So in Victorian times, you know, it was again, it was a sign of wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One question: You said um, if you look at males by uh, income level in the U.S., there's hardly any of that. What about females? So uh, yeah, I may not so. So if you look at, at sort of black males, white males, and Hispanic males, and you should, and you go across the income, it's it's generally flat. For females, it does slope down. So so higher higher income females do tend to weigh a little bit less, but it's about one BMI point. Whereas if you look at the difference, say between whites and blacks, it's, it's, the gap is huge. So the the racial effects far trump the the income effects, and it, you you know some of you guys are, who, who are sociologists probably know better about what's driving these racial effects, but it's it's not money, it's other things. Maybe some of it's genetic, I don't know, but I think there's other things that at play there. So you know, not to say that obesity is not bad. I mean, certainly um, it is. You know, my point is it may not be bad enough to get people to sort of make these behavior changes. Just w one more slide to try to set the stage. This is a paper we published at some point last year using US data to show the cost of obesity. And in fact, there's sort of two things to take away from, from this slide. These are medical expenditures increase with increasing weight, which, which we know, we knew, because diseases increase with increasing weight. This is absenteeism, also increases with increasing weight. And then this is presenteeism using this work productivity and activity impairment index, which is some validated, whatever that means, scale that measures presenteeism, which people tend to use. And I, I don't necessarily trust the, the levels, but, but certainly people are reporting that health is reducing their productivity on the job. And so, you know, to me, the things that stand out here is certainly even among normal weight individuals, you have high costs due to health. And then they increase with increasing BMI. So I, I use this, you know, I'm interested in incentives for, for behavior change. And I always try to sell these incentives as well. Obesity costs a lot of money, and so if you can spend some money to get people to lose weight or engage in healthy behaviors, it could be a profit-mizing strategy. So in all of my grants, I use this sort of framework to try to sell why companies might use economic incentives or wellness programs. The reality is the data is incredibly weak on whether or not any of this stuff would be profit-maximizing, and it probably isn't, but, you know, I try. <laughs> Yeah, these are annual. And this is actually, if you're interested, it was published in, in JOEM. I can send you the, the paper. So here, there's just a little bit of similar data using Asian data, but certainly that, if, you know, obesity is bad regardless of where you live in the world, and so the trend is costs go up with increasing BMI. Uh, so just, just sort of a general recap. The, the one thing I, I want to make the point on this slide is, you know, nowadays everything is behavioral. If you're not doing behavioral economics, you're like, you know, you're, you're not, you're, you're way behind. And, and so I, I just want to make the point, there certainly are some behavioral issues with respect to food consumption behaviors, maybe less so with physical activity. Uh, but traditional economics, as I said, really does a very nice job of explaining rising rates of obesity, this sort of food price argument and opportunity cost argument. That's classical economics, and it really works very well in explaining behavior. And so I think people need to keep that in mind, because as I said, when you're thinking about interventions, think about them in the context of sort of this classical model. The behavioral stuff does add value, and there are certainly things that you can do to sort of manipulate people into doing things that you might want them to do. But I think losing sight of this classical model would be problematic. So let me just talk a little bit about some of the research that, that we've done and, and maybe some brainstorming ideas for what, what might be interesting to do. So the, the first one, we, we published a paper uh, last year looking specifically at, at uh, targeting taxes at sugar-sweetened beverages. So the logic behind these taxes, and in fact, several municipalities have, have tried to get them going. And in fact, Seattle or King County actually passed a large one that was later repealed. Uh, but, but these things are certainly floated uh, by state and local governments, and so it's a relevant research question. And uh, people drink lots of these beverages. In fact, if you look at them by calories consumed, uh, SSBs are actually the number one food group in the American diet, as scary as it is. And so, and in fact, there's research that shows that, you know, SSB consumption is bad for your health, and in fact, people who quit 
uh, drinking SSPs actually loosen weight and improve their health. Well, I should say, by the way, there was a paper that came out not too long ago that shows that diet soda actually increases your risk of heart disease, and so maybe we should tax that too. But it's putting that aside. So there's certainly some, some reason to, to focus on SSPs particularly. Now, we, so we published this paper where we, we actually said, well, everybody knows if you, if you tax and rise, raise the price, people will consume less. And in fact, that was sort of the main strategy for getting people to, to quit smoking, right? Huge cigarette taxes worked uh, very well in, in reducing cigarette consumption. In fact, when these taxes erode due to inflation, smoking tends to, to increase. But it's a little bit more complicated, or in fact, a lot more complicated with respect to, to targeting a particular food or food category, because with smoking, there is a, a little bit of an ability to switch to get buy longer cigarettes, which people did, or to switch to smokeless tobacco, which people did. But there's not so much you can do. Uh, whereas with food, you know, if you tax, say, soda, people can switch to, you know, Gatorade or, or high calories. And if you tax soda and Gatorade, they can switch to, to fruit drinks and so on and so forth. So we looked at, in this particular paper at people's willingness to switch from SSBs to other beverages. And in fact, uh, because of that switching, the impact of these types of taxes is much less than you would expect. So in this paper, so the, probably the best thing, just take a look here. This is a 40% price increase on SSBs, which is big, right? And in fact, bigger than a 40% tax, because the reality is suppliers will take a hit. So if you do a 40% tax, some of the increase will be absorbed in the reduced profit margins of suppliers, so the price won't increase by 40%. That's something that sort of tends to be lost by policymakers, but that's the reality. In fact, for a 15% tax, I'm not sure the price would go up at all. I think we would see a 15% cut in profits. So here, if you look at this tax, what we find is that we do see a reduction in calories per day uh, of you know between like 15 and 25 from beverages but in fact all of the effect happens in middle income households so for the low income households and higher income households we don't see any statistically significant effect so the net effect is about 12 and a half calories per day uh, which you know is probably overly optimistic given the 40 percent tax wouldn't raise prices by 40 percent so very small effect uh, of these types of taxes when you look at beverages because of this willingness to switch to other beverages due to a price increase. So why do we find no effect for the richest and poorest households? Well, we, we certainly expected this. Rich people can afford to, to pay a little bit more for their soda. And in fact, they pay a lot more for their soda. If you look at the raw data, poor people buy generics, they buy in bulk, they wait for sales. And so the price per calorie from soda is about half of what it is for rich people who tend to buy specialty brands and sort of better stuff. And in fact, that, I'm about half through a paper that just looks at, just talks about sort of different purchasing patterns. I've been about half through it for about six months. So I'm hoping to get a little bit more progress on it. But, but it's interesting to see the different consumption patterns. Poor households, I think they're just sa savvy purchasers. And so they're able to sort of be creative in the way they shop and get around some of these effects. And so, uh, you know, in the paper we say, well, the, the plus size is these uh, taxes don't tend to be regressive. Uh, but the downside is they're not regressive because they really don't work on low-income households. So this paper got a lot of attention, and uh, in fact, Robert Wood Johnson, who funded it, was sort of disappointed in, in the findings. But I think they've been validated and replicated now in, in several different studies, and so I think they, they probably are, are fairly accurate. But in fact, the second paper, which I actually I think I submitted yesterday or today, my wife <laughs> said it, but the, the second paper re revisits this question, but we don't just look at beverage switching. We actually extend it to other food products. And the reason we do that is I was sort of writing this paper, and at one point I realized that this paper is problematic. And the reason, uh, wait until after the publisher, of course, but the reason, the reason it's problematic is because if you look at beverages, and you look at calories per dollar spent, SSBs are very calorie dense, and so uh, per dollar spent, if you just look at beverages and you look at switching to other beverages, you're, you're guaranteed to find a reduction because there's no way to switch to something that's higher in calories. 
So this is sort of the best case scenario when you allow some level of switching. But when you broaden it to foods, it turns out that per dollar spent, SSBs are not even in the top uh, list of most calorie dense products. Candy, cookies, salty snacks, per dollar spent, are actually higher in calories. And so if you allow switching to these higher calorie per dollar products, you could find that net calories would go up if people switch. So let me give you an example. Say you have two vending machines right next to each other. One is you know, all Coke and the other one is all Snickers bars. And say they both cost about a dollar, which I think is, is reasonable. Well, it turns out a Snicker bar, which I like, I like Coke too by the way, uh, has far more calories than a Coke. So, and by the way, it has more sodium and more fat, right? So if you tax Coke by 40% and people will say, you know, they need their sugar fix, which in fact there's research to suggest that that's why people buy these high calorie products, and you get them to switch from Coke to candy, well, guess what? You probably made people fatter and they're consuming more sodium and potentially worse off. Do you think though there's a social stigma? Like if you go to a meeting and you see for the five people drinking Coke versus for the five people eating a Snickers bar. Um, to me, that would send such a different message in terms of, you know, it's very socially acceptable to have um, these sweet or SSBs all the time in your hand, but you wouldn't be walking, I mean, in some circles, you probably wouldn't be walking around with candy bars. I don't know. I thought you were going to say the opposite. I don't know where, which way it goes, but I mean, interestingly, in, in Singapore, People tend not to eat candy. You, don't, you just don't have a lot of candy bars. You notice that? Like there's not a lot of candy vending machines. Here in the US, I don't know. I mean, certainly if you go to vending areas, you see lots of Coke, you see lots of candy bars. So I, I, I'm an economist, so I always downplay anything that's not economic, but I don't really know the answer to that. Some of you guys may have more insight on that. You know, I, I tend to look at what you're describing. I always put these as, as cost. So if there's some social stigma associated with drinking Coke or eating candy, to me that's a that's a cost, a social cost. And so when you're making your purchasing decisions, you'll look at the price and you'll also say, just like smoking, like, well, I don't want to be vilified by having a cigarette out in front of that building, so maybe I will, I'll smoke a little less, or at least I'll, I'll hide, hide it a little bit better. So the, the second paper that we looked at did it, tested exactly what I just described, and in fact, uh, sure enough, when we added candy into the mix, and it turned out that candy and SSBs are highly substitutable, which probably isn't that surprising because if you look at you know the end of aisles in the supermarkets right before you check out, there's lots of candy, lots of soda, movie theaters, candy, soda vending, and so we found, uh, you know, if you tax soda only, you get an increase in calories, fat, and sodium purchases, right? Not good, uh, but if you tax candy, we actually found that you get reductions. And the reason was, for whatever reason, if you tax soda, there's a lot of switching to candy. But if you tax candy, candy consumption goes down, but we didn't see as much of a switch to soda. Now, I don't have an easy explanation for that, except that maybe candy is sort of a last minute purchase, and that people don't go back and get the beverages, but with soda, there tends to be more switching. I, I don't know. Sorry, can you just like quickly summarize like are these simulations or? What oh, are sorry, sorry. So all this is based on supermarket scanner data. Okay. Yeah. So there, there's a data set called the Nielsen Home Scan Pound, but essentially it's it's okay. store bought scanned food, right? So one of the things that I want to do is actually replicate these things using experimental data. Now I, I have been working, and we published uh, one paper with Len Epstein at University of Buffalo, where we did use an experimental setting and simulated tax and subsidy options, and in fact. In that paper, we show that taxes get people to consume fewer calories. Subsidies on healthier foods actually get people to consume more calories because they buy more healthy foods and then they take the savings and they buy more junk. So subsidies alone tend to be problematic. So the, the nutshell for this is basically what, what we think is that if, you, if, if you're interested in trying to get people to consume healthier diets, you need to be a little smarter about how you implement these types of taxes. And the argument that, that we make is think along the dimensions of calories per dollar. If you tax high calorie per dollar items, they'll be switching into lower calorie per dollar items and you'll be most likely to see reductions. Right? And so I, uh, I'm working with a colleague uh, at RTI, one of my 
who co-authored on these papers to write a grant to use the same data set to stimulate effects of these more sophisticated tax strategies. So we'll see how it goes. Go ahead. Um, did you see the, a couple of slides ago you pointed out that um, sweet and beverage consumption has gone up dramatically in the last, what, 15 years or something like that. Um, is that the same as the candy? Is, has candy? Good question. I don't know. I, I suspect it is because anything with added sugars and added fats is generally becoming less expensive. Uh, there, I think in the last couple years, like two or three years, with all of the emphasis on obesity, there's been a reduction in, in SSBs and probably candy, but that's, I think, a fairly new phenomenon. But I, I should take a look at that. Okay. I have a quick question. I mean, so these are tax items. I mean, one of the interesting things is, you know, Compared to fresh foods, uh, you know, especially in Singapore, I just came back from the Middle East, it's so much cheaper to actually buy fresh foods that aren't, you know, you know, processed. So, and, and most of those aren't taxed, right? So part of it is like, what about the price gap between these processed foods versus those that aren't? Well, so in the U.S., processed foods are generally cheaper than fresh foods, and so right. that's partly what's driving right. their behavior. So, yeah, I mean, to the extent that that you change relative prices, I think you will see changes in, in behavior. And in fact, you know, it may be part of the reason why you don't see as high obesity prevalence in some of these other places is because these processed foods are less prevalent or, you know, the relative price gap is smaller. Yeah, and let me articulate the question a little bit better because you answered that. So what about if the gap between the sort of the obesity issue is more not just within things that are taxed, but also the gap between the things that are healthy and fresh, uh, and all of these items that are taxed, sort of like the grocery store aisles versus, you know, the grocery store perimeter in the U.S. context. So, I mean, what, what we're what, what's driving these results here is is price changes. So, although we're calling it a tax, the data is really just data that has variations in price. So we're looking at variations in prices. So whatever's driving those variations, be it market forces or government taxes. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but you'll see sort of those will drive behavior. Other, go ahead. Eric, um, Kelly Brownell from the Red Center was here last week, and he made a very strong um, argument that there's no that if you really want to affect obesity rates, behavior change is not going to be the way to do it. He makes the argument that it's, you got to you got to take you know the McDonald's and the Cokes and all the big corporations head on. As a way to as a way to really affect change, well, how do you? I would have loved for the two of you to be in a room together. We um, have been in a room together. It never <laughs> goes well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, he, to some extent, Kelly's Kelly's right, but I think there's a fundamental question where we disagree, and it's the extent to which people really want that. The reality is, people don't want that. People like McDonald's, and people don't have to eat at McDonald's, right? And so. The, the, the question that, that I always pose to Kelly is, what evidence do you have that people are worse off as a result of the prevalence of all these fast food restaurants and, and, and obesity, right? I mean, market forces are driving this behavior, and so why would you sort of forcibly make people worse off because you don't like the fact that people are overweight or obese, right? And that, to me, is sort of the crux of the problem. It's not that you couldn't get people to weigh less. I mean, in Singapore, they make kids walk up and down stairs in the schools if they're overweight or obese. I mean, we could do that here, too, for everybody. But I just, and in fact, Japan is sort of doing that now, too. But I mean, it seems to me that, that that's basically taking Kelly's views or, or the public health view and forcing everybody to conform to that view, when the reality is all of us engage in behaviors that increase our risks of poor health to varying degrees. But, but most of us do that fairly well informed, and we do it because there's enough benefit that we think it's worth it. I just wanted a quick question on that line. Um, so there was a recent conference at Fuqua where Hank Cardello came and spoke, and it was a bunch of MDs slash MBAs. And I was sitting with a bunch of the MDs, and they said, well, nothing's going to change until we find a pill for it. And they were dead serious. You know, there was a lot of talk about behavior. So I mean, I just want to hear. So let, let me rush ahead. I actually have some data on bariatric surgery that I'll talk about okay. quick from Project Tools and I are working on that. It's a procedure which actually works better than the pills, uh, and it presents some interesting questions as well. So let me talk a little bit about uh, 
uh, some of the food information stuff. So uh, some of you may have seen, so we, we did a study looking at taco time in, in Seattle where they implemented mandatory menu labeling and we quantified whether it worked. And we had a really nice design because we had uh, taco time restaurants within King County that were subject to the legislation and we had taco time restaurants outside King County. We had pre-data, we had post so we had a really rich design. And we were able to test whether or not mandatory menu labeling, calories, fat, and sodium gets people to change behavior. So here's what we found. This is transactions, uh, very seasonal, so you see these seasonal ups and downs. Uh, and in fact, there's a little bit higher uh, transactions in, in uh, King County just because it's more dense, population dense. But if you look at this, what you see is that these two uh, lines mirror each other, right? So this here is when the menu labeling went into effect within the stores. Here they added it to the drive-through menu boards. No discernible effect whatsoever. And in fact, if you look at average calories per transaction, which is ultimately what you're trying to do, is get people to consume fewer calories, again, nothing. And we've stared at these lines forever and they just look the same. And we've looked at drink calories, and food calories, and dessert calories, no effect whatsoever. So again, RWJ, who funded part of this research, was also not so happy with us because they were hoping, and Kelly was hoping, that these things would work. Uh, and in fact, they don't. And it's not just a taco time. There's data from Brian Elbel's work in New York. There's data from, from Dan Ariely's work and Panda something or other. They, they just, it just tends not to work. Uh, go ahead. But could you say that it's one thing for taco time to list this taco has 600 calories? It's another thing for Taco Time to make that taco at 300 calories, and that's the product that they sell. So maybe an argument for, I mean, taking on, are people smart enough to use that information to their advantage? It doesn't sound like it, but Wait, 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 wait. careful. Because what makes you think people aren't smart? Well, I'm just thinking that if they, if you go up to Taco Time and you know what you want to order, you're not changing your opinion. Based people, on people were so smart that they didn't need this calorie information. They knew what they liked, and you gave them new calorie information, and they consumed the exact same thing. So why are they not smart? Well, just <clears throat> going along with the idea that they are smart, is I mean, is is there value in asking them or determining total calorie consumption over the entire day? Maybe they uh, as a result of could. I mean, I I didn't do it. I it would, I would do it, but I would bet you free taco time meals that you would see the same thing. I have eaten at taco time, I went to University of Washington, it's actually quite good. But I mean, I, I'm just pushing back on you a little bit because there's a sort of preconceived notion that people are making mistakes, or making bad choices. Maybe they are, but there's no evidence that they are, right? Maybe they're making such good choices that you don't need to give them any information. And in fact, uh, I'll give you a little bit more uh, uh, examples about that. Taco Time uh, had what's called healthy highlights logos uh, on their menu. And they, these pointed out the options that were generally healthier. And so maybe those healthy highlights options were all you needed to convey to consumers what was healthier. And so I make the example of Diet Coke. You know, if you want to consume a healthier or at least a lower calorie beverage, do you really need to know how many calories are in a Coke to know that diet has less? So maybe people already had these cues. Uh, and so that would be why it tended not to work in, in taco time potentially. Uh, and I'll also point out that you didn't need government legislation for taco time to put the healthy highlights things on the menu. And in fact, what taco time told me was one of the best things they ever did was put all white meat chicken in their products. It really increased demand and increased profits. And so there were some things that taco time had done uh, to try to market healthier entrees. And one of it is like, isn't there something about like individual motivation? Like, for people that <clears throat> calorie, the calories don't matter, whether or not you show them the calories, because they're not really calorie conscious. They're not really uh, tuned into what, why they, why they need to know that information. Why do they need to know that information? They don't. They, most people don't need to know that information. So because they have no motivation to know that information. Right. So right. what's the problem? Well, but for people who do have the motivation they can, to have that information. They can buy, eat this, that, not that, and they can go on the website. It and wouldn't be helpful to have it there present. So that it it might be. If they the really helpful. wanted it, they would go to Subway, who has it. <laughs> it's true. Right. But, well, all I'm saying is, like, what's the, 
I mean, I mean, I'm pushing back on this point. Wait, but you, you just made the point that a lot of people have tried to diet and they're not successful. Right, because it's hard. So right. they've learned that dieting is not in their best interest, so they don't do it. Well, it's not in their best interest because of effort spent. It's not not in their best interest in terms of their long-term <coughs> goal of reducing weight. Yeah, but right. you so can't long-term reduce weight without long-term diet and exercise. And so, right. so the my only point so is it's this kind of time preference trade-off, right? What well, we're willing to do now because it's easy versus what we really want to do in the future. When you right. ask people what they want in the future, yes, everybody wants to live longer and be healthier. No, no, no. They want to live longer and be healthier if it's costless. When, when given that the amount of work involved, most people will say it's not worth it. Their, That's my point. Their, their, their behavior indicates that it's not worth it. But if you ask them, they're certainly not saying, yes, I'd rather have a Snicker bars today so I can live two years less down the road. No one's making that trade-off, but they are making the trade-off to say, well, it's a little <coughs> too hard, I'm a little bit lazy, I have self-control issues, and so. Well, right, so, so, but I mean, I think that it's the, it's the self-control angle you have to convince me of. And I'm not saying it's not true, but you'd have to convince me of that in order to convince me that we should outlaw McDonald's, right? Because unless no, there's... I'm not making the argument we should outlaw McDonald's. Well, but, but Kelly sort of would be pushing that. Or the, so that's sort of the public health model. I mean, I see your point, and I'm sort of taking this to the extreme, but I think it's worth sort of thinking through these arguments. I mean, yeah. they have signs you know, um, along the pool, don't run, because you could slip. But not everybody runs, and you know, and but there's still the signs there for little kids, you know, to be aware. Some people pay attention, some people don't. But the well, signs are still there. Well, is, is so so let me just say this: the kids, rates? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. But kid, kids are a different story. I mean, kids clearly, uh, their brains aren't developed. They, we know that kids don't make optimal choices, and so I would argue that. There's lots of things that would be appropriate to do for kids that I'm, I'm not entirely convinced are appropriate to do for adults, or at least the, these sort of arguments that, that we need to do things, you know, as Kelly would say, because we, it's, the, it's in their best interest. I think that's easy sell for kids, but for adults, I think it's tougher. Let, let me just press on and, and show you one more thing. Uh, yeah, so I think it's worth it. And then if anyone wants to stay, I'll show some other results on bariatric surgery and stuff. But, here, I, we ran a quick study, so our argument was, well, the healthy highlights was a pretty good indicator, potentially, of behavior, so you didn't need calorie posting. So in Singapore, they have something similar. They have the healthier choice items that the Singapore Health Promotion Board puts on items. And one thing about Singaporeans is they actually have a lot of trust in government. So you could put this Health Promotion Board logo on anything, and people would think it was good or at least that's what was our hypothesis. And so we went out and, and tested that hypothesis by putting it on cake. And we wanted to see whether people would actually you know, consume more cake because the government was telling them this is healthy cake. And so we, this was just a, a, a simple study, and we didn't actually have them purchase the cake, it was just NUS business school students, so we are gonna run this for real. But we just, the, the NUS has a, a lab, I think Fuqua has one too, where you can get students to do, answer some questions. So we showed them you know, these two pictures. In one setting, we showed the logo next to the cake, and one we didn't. And in both, we actually gave them the calorie information. And so basically, we were wanting to see, with calorie information, could you generate an increase in cake consumption just because of the logo? Right? So our people are looking at this. And in fact, here's the, the no logo scenario. What we found is that if you gave people this option, 70% said they would choose the fruit plate, and 30% said the cake. And then when we give them the logo, uh, not surprisingly, 50% uh, from 30% said they would choose the cake. So the healthy cake, the HPB blessed cake, now is, is consumed in much greater, or at least they say they consume it in much greater demand. And, and so whether or not this would hold in the US, I'm not sure, but the point of this was to, were to talk to the Health Promotion Board and say, look, you've got a very powerful mess, you know, tool here, don't waste it, and in fact, they do, they give this logo, basically they take foods by product, and within a product they rank the order of them. And the foods that are sort of below the median in certain characteristics get the logo. They're by no means healthy, but they're certainly healthier than the other stuff within the product. So I was trying to say you guys need to be a little bit careful uh, in some of the things. And in fact, like tea, sweet tea, sort of the green tea that they sell, is 
very high in calories, but are actually a little bit better than soda, and so that gets the logo. And there actually is a cake in Singapore that gets the logo because it's below the median in terms of calories. So some interesting results here. But in fact, you know, there's questions about what's the best information to put on nutrition facts panels? Is it detailed information? Is it the stoplight system or the star system or something like this? And so our argument is, well, maybe this sort of simple message, at least for Singapore, probably works better. Or certainly even with calorie information, it has a sad effect. We're doing a little bit more. Go ahead. Isn't it the same thing that a lot of uh, manufacturers are doing for things like whole grain fruit loops or something? You know, I well, mean, it's kind of the same idea. They're putting some little. You know, yeah, although I think the manufacturers are probably doing it more so to confuse consumers yes. as opposed to get them to buy healthier products. Um, and in fact, the the industry just came up with their own front of package labels to try to do an end run on government efforts to do so. And my suspicion is they know that they won't work. Because sometimes it's like, oh, the newest fad is high fiber. Right. And, and now lately you've seen no high fructose corn syrup. I mean, yeah. there's so many different things that, you know, people who don't have any information, how do they know? You know low carbs, high protein. So, so just one other comment about this. So we, we subdivided the results by people who claim to be dieters or non-dieters. And in fact, what we found was that uh, the symbol had a huge effect on the dieters. So from nobody saying they would choose the cake up to 31%. So people who, you know, who are less health conscious, maybe their logo isn't as salient to them. But if you're if you're thinking about trying to consume healthier things, uh, you see that logo, it makes more of a difference to you. So it's interesting. So we're certainly interested in trying to do more of this type of research, both with Taco Time, who promised us more data, although they got some bad press from our last paper, so that may not happen. But either with Taco Time or with some other places in, in Singapore. Uh, so I, I, let me skip that. Uh, and in fact, I, I'll go very quickly here. So we have a lot of projects. Uh, I've done a, with collaborators at UNC, we've done quite a few studies looking at incentive based uh, weight loss and walking programs. Uh, the reality is these things tend to work pretty well for the short term and not so good for the long term, although I continue to, to try to test them and vary. There's a million different ways you can package incentives, and so we keep tweaking the models. But you know, I think that the reality is incentive-based programs work just like regular weight loss programs. They work well in the short term and not so good in the long term. So the extent that you can maybe find some optimal mix of these things, we're, we're continuing to monkey with it. but starting to become a little bit more pessimistic about the ability of these things to really do long-term sustained behavior change. Still have a bunch of grants in and still hoping to do more of that, but I'm skeptical. Or at least it may be the amount of money it would take or whatever way you're going to try to influence behavior would be so big that it would just never be, be implemented. So it, it's noon. I don't know. Uh, I, I actually... Stop there. Although if people are interested, I could talk a little bit about bariatric surgery and some recent findings. So I actually don't don't have the the slides for it here, but I'll, I'll, let me just talk my way through it, and, and I'll tell you what we found. So basically, you know, your comment about the pill. Well, I, I've heard that for some time now. It turns out pills have had a bad run in terms of weight loss, but starting with Ramona Band, which was. Uh, not approved and ultimately not widely distributed. There's been three more weight loss pills that have gone up for FDA approval of late and, and, and not fared well, partly because the weight loss is mediocre and the side effects uh, risks are fairly great. Now, uh, bariatric surgery, uh, gastric banding and gastric bypass actually have good long-term results, very invasive for, for the bypass less so for banding, and in fact now they're doing gastric sleeves, they're doing all sorts of, of other things, so lots of procedures. So, uh, and, and as I said, uh, you know, certainly for the BMI 40 plus group, there's evidence in decreased mortality over 10 years, there's fairly significant weight loss evidence at five years, so there's, there's certainly, these things tend to work. Uh, gastric banding is, is less invasive, a little bit cheaper, and in fact, uh, Allergan, who I do some consulting for, just to be upfront about that, uh, went to the FDA and asked if they could get uh, the, the label extended to a 30 to 35 BMI population. And in fact, it was just approved. So the FDA reviewed it and said, we think this is a, a, a safe and worthwhile procedure for that target population. Partly because 
there's lots of evidence to suggest that uh, gastric banding and bypass work really well for diabetes resolution. For, for bypass, it tends to be very quick. For band, it's less quick. But if you look over time, there's, there's long-term evidence to suggest it works. And so the, the question that, that Trulls and I and a colleague from Duke NUS were looking at was, well, OK, so now you've got another 50 million people who potentially could benefit from this procedure. You know, should physicians recommend this procedure for this 30 to 35 group? And so part of the answer is based on whether or not it works. And as I said, there's some evidence that it does, at least in the higher groups. But, but part of it should depend on the extent to which this population would either gain enough weight that they ultimately would be eligible anyway, or whether or not they might lose weight to the extent that they don't really need a surgical intervention because you know, ultimately they might drop down some weight too. So we, we used a, the NLSY data, which is panel, and we took a bunch of people who were surgery eligible that it were in that new range, the 30 to 35 BMI range, in uh, 1990. So we had 18 years of follow-up, and, and we used trajectory class analysis to, to look at BMI trajectories among this group to figure out you know, the extent to which the, the sort of different subclasses within this group either gain enough weight to be surgery eligible or tend to lose weight so that they wouldn't need it. And so uh, we're writing these results up now, but essentially what we found was that uh, virtually nobody who starts out with a BMI 30 to 35 gets down to a normal weight. Mm -hmm. There's a very small percentage, about 10% or so, who get down to like a BMI of 29. So they lose a little bit of weight. Uh, and to me, what that says is that diet and exercise are failures. They, they just don't work for this target population, right? So that's a, that's a myth that this group can lose weight successfully. But is that, yeah. is that's controlling for do they diet and exercise? I mean, how do you no, I mean, it's populated, but I mean, this is sort of real world population level data. Some do, some don't, but basically population level, you just don't see these people losing any weight. So what it says to me is if you have a BMI between 30 and 35, the probability that you're ever going to get down below 29 is very, very small. The data suggests that, right? So that says, well, you know, we probably can't count on traditional diet and exercise. There's really no pharmacologic interventions. Uh, does surgery make sense? Well, if you look at the trajectories on the tail, we found sort of a four-class solution for these, for men and for women. You know, about 9% or 10% tend to get down to about a 29 or so BMI. About 30% of the sample stays within that 30 to 35 range, although creeping up just a little bit over the 18 years. And then the remaining sample was sort of roughly split between a group who very quickly shot up to have BMIs above 40 and a group who sort of more slowly got up to a BMIs about 35 or 36 over time. But basically about half the sample or more, uh, depending on whether it was men or women, 50 to 60%, would ultimately be eligible for the surgery anyway. And virtually nobody is losing any weight. So I mean, I'm not sort of saying these people should go out and get surgery, but you know, to the extent to which you'd, you'd be eligible anyway, and if you were interested in that procedure, maybe getting it sooner than later has some, some benefit. There have been studies tracking what happens after bariatric surgery and um, weight maintenance or weight gain for years afterwards? Yeah, there certainly are. I mean, part of the challenge is that these procedures t tend to change so quickly. Like, like 10 years ago, nobody did laparoscopic procedures, and now it's all laparoscopic. The, 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 the bands are different than they used to be. The, so it's hard. But, but long-term, the, like the Swedish obesity study, which is the best long-term mortality study, has data over 10 years, and it shows there's decreases in mortality compared to controls. There's data. Uh, do people creep back up? Yeah, surgery? some do. Regardless some do. of what kind of procedure uh, it was. Yeah. Um, so the best results tend to be around two years out, and then there is some creeping back. They tend not to gain all the way back, but there's like a huge reduction, and then there's some gain. And in fact, for diabetes resolution, your best, you know, your best evidence seem to occur around one year. But, but on net, looking around five years, out, they they tend to be better than they were when they started, whereas groups who don't get the procedure tend to continue to gain weight. So net net, I think these procedures are in fact, you know, health improving for the people who get them. Now, so interestingly, when I talk to the sort of the, the surgery community, Allergan, for example, they, 
they can't understand why insurers and employers aren't covering this procedure. And I, you know, they, they said given all the benefits, and they of course put together these giant reports showing how great these things are. And and so you know, my comment to them is if you believe all this to be true, and maybe it is, you know, why aren't individuals themselves paying twelve thousand dollars to get these procedures, right? And in fact, I you know I've talked to quite a few people who've gotten the procedures, who, who, you know the. The ones I always meet are the ones that you know these companies bring in, so they're the best case scenarios. And they talk about how it's changed their lives, blah blah blah. Uh, and yet, you know, most people, you know, take up rates for these types of procedures are like one percent. So very few people tend to get them. So it's not a cure all for obesity, but I think you know, if if it is good as as people say it is, it, you know, it's certainly a relevant question why people who are at very high risk of, of you know disease and poor health don't take these things up you know, in, in greater numbers. Right. So I'll, I'll stop. I know we went over. I'm sorry about that. But if people have comments or questions, I'm happy to, to hang out. In that trajectory analysis, did you just take then those people that were in the 30 plus and then do the class solution on those? Yeah, and for that analysis, Trulls and Rahul have actually done some of the work for other, for the entire population published that. Yeah. yeah. Earlier article. Yeah. International Journal. I mean, we were specifically in, I mean, our research question was focused just on this particular group. Yeah. yeah. And, and say then, did you say that the people that were hot, the highest, did they continue to, to rise? or? Did well, they... I mean, everybody was 30 to 35 when they started. And they all kind of stayed. And, and so there was four, sort of four types of individuals. Our analysis showed a four class solution. And two of the four, which represented about 55% of the sample, ultimately gained significant weight. Yeah. And then one sort of stayed flat and the other one showed a very slight decline to BMI of about 29 after 18 years. Were, were there any predictors of why that was? You know, we, we tried to look at it. So we stratified by gender. Uh, NLSY is not a health data set, so there wasn't a lot to look at. So we looked at, at race and education, and they weren't predictors. Probably because once you stratify by, you know, you, race certainly is a predictor for, for obesity, but we're targeting a group within this range. So once you do that, race tends not to work. And same with education. Uh, what we did find those who were sort of on the higher end of the 30 to 35 group were more likely to, to be on the higher trajectories. So if you have a BMI of 30, 31, you were more likely to sort of stay in the range than if you had a BMI of 34. Uh, but we couldn't really look at, say, diabetes prevalence. We had hoped to. Going back to all these studies on calories and, and labeling around calories, has there been anything similar on portion control? Like, like th there's one um, fairly impressive commercial weight loss program out there called Naturally Slim. It's by Trajectory Health. And its whole thing is like, we, we focus too much on what we eat and how many calories it is and you fall into these traps where you see those little symbols that says this is healthy so you think you can eat twice as much because it was healthy and, it, and instead their, their weight loss program focuses on portion size. You should never eat more than a loosely held fist worth of food and you can eat whatever you want within that loosely held fist and if you only did that two or three times a day then it doesn't matter how many, if it's McDonald's, like you don't need to ban well, the McDonald's it's the problem that we're eating so much. Are there any studies out there like? Yeah, I mean, certainly Brian Wansick has done stuff on portion sizes. Dana Ariely recently had some a study looking at sort of the ability to sort of rein people in on their hand Express. Trying to portion. interview them, trying yeah, to. Yeah, a little of, bit. I mean, but these, I mean, when you say it's fairly impressive, how do you know? I mean, is there legitimate data on it? Well, so I had them run, we, we were using their 10 week online program for our clergy health study with. Um, with uh, 1,100 pastors, and so, but I had them run their own intent to treat analyses on, on um, they were looking at metabolic syndrome in particular, so they would take like an entire, they'd offer this to um, an entire hospital system, and about 10% of the employees would, would pick up on it, and because they're all hospital employees, they get their annual labs every year, so they can look even at the people who didn't attend all 10 sessions, and things like that, and average weight loss is 12 pounds, and then it's but not. We, uh, you have selection bias in there, right? I mean, the ten percent. Yeah. Who yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm not convinced that would hold up in a, in a randomized. I mean, maybe it works, but I, 
Yeah. It, but I, I believe it gets away from the entire, like the, the entire frame of all, all of this is calorie counting. Well, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. All I'm saying yeah. is everything, it's very easy to get short-term weight loss and some of these sort of studies are, are no, problematic. So whether or not that you're, what you're describing works long-term. If you're right, I mean, if people did what you're describing, I agree they would lose weight. It just people tend not to. Tend not to do it. Yeah. I, and so I was just curious if there was. Portion, I mean, uh, you know, like, I, I, I don't know, but like, for example, in Singapore, I can tell you, like, people just eat smaller portion sizes, and that probably has something to do with why they, they tend to weigh less. Interestingly, like, we, we was crave Subway, like, at least once a week, um, we need American food. And if you go to Subway in Singapore, they don't even advertise footlongs. You can get them if you ask, but they tend not to address because people just don't, don't do it, except for, you know, things.